Hi, you're listening to Redneck Theology, a short program providing a common sense look at Christianity. I'm your host, Bill Witte. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Now, on with the broadcast. Christian Sales. As I prepare this podcast, much of the world is preparing for the start of the Christmas shopping season. Be coming up real soon. And although I appreciate Christian-owned and operated businesses having sales, that's not what the title refers to. Christianity, and I use the term in the broadest of applications here, suffers from the grand confusion surrounding sales. I refer to the merchandising of Christianity in the church. More often than I care to remember, I've heard remarks about money-making aspect of various, quote, ministries. One only needs a short period of interaction with what I'll call the unchurched before some referencing to a church, ministry, preacher, or other figure of Christianity just looking for money comes up. Much of the American public view the church as money-hungry. We'll never live up to the expectations of everyone, but we need to be honest. Those who view the church as out to get their money arrived at that opinion for a reason. While it's true that someone will always find fault, and some people continually look for reasons to complain and or justify themselves, we Christians are responsible for much of the problem. Recognizing this might help in understanding that many people aren't trying to place blame as much as they are venting frustration and expressing confusion. See, we tell the world Jesus is the answer to all their problems, and our problems. We tell them how we trust God for everything. We attempt to convince others that all they need is Jesus and that he will supply all their needs. And if they'll just turn their lives over to him, that he'll take care of all these things for them. And all these promises have a scriptural basis. Often we quote biblical texts to prove what we're saying is true. We know how God has met our needs. We may even give examples from our own lives. So what's the problem? Those we're telling these things to get confused. When they see things in our lives, they don't believe match up to what we say. Not everyone who is a Christian shares the same degree of growth and or experience. Not everyone who is a Christian comes from the same background. Not all have the same needs. And on top of that, not everyone who says they are a Christian agrees on what it means to wear the label. Even those that do agree may vary in just how dedicated they are to the principles they claim to believe in. If we expect to share the truth of the gospel with those needing to accept it, we must understand why so many feel the church is greedy. I recently happened across a religious broadcast. It was hosted by someone I didn't even realize was still on the air. I never followed this person's broadcast, but I was familiar with it. I'd seen it from time to time, and it seemed like their ministry was always trying to guilt people into giving. Now, I'm sure that wasn't how they viewed it, but that's how it came across to me. The program was always full of special offers or uh, gifts that were given in exchange for a specific offering. As a young Christian, it never made a lot of sense to me to tell people how badly they needed a particular tape or a book or a CD that, that was available, and then how everyone ought to have it, and how it would change their life, and then require a so-called gift in order to receive it. I noticed the last 11 minutes of a program that I happened on this morning were spent telling people how much of a blessing they would receive just as soon as they committed to sending $300. That was the last 11 minutes of a 30-minute broadcast. Somehow I suspect this wasn't the first mention of it during the broadcast. Now, I admit, I didn't see the start or the middle of it. What I did see sounded like a guarantee of prosperity in return for a specific amount of money. Why wouldn't anyone send in $300 if they believed God was somehow now obligated to repay them ten times that amount? Why wouldn't they? The airwaves and the internet are full of men and women promoting special offers of such things as uh, 
for instance, sacred anointing oil mixed by a special biblical formula and had just a little touch of red color to it. Or specially blessed Peter and Paul napkin holders. They're made from olive wood, and the olive wood is from the trees growing in the heart of the Holy Land. Perhaps you'd rather have a, a prayer shawl crafted from cloth manufactured right in Jerusalem. Then there's always the limited time offers for books, CDs, DVDs, MP3s, and you know other items that every Christian just absolutely needs. Of course, then there's always the outright request for money. But even then, just asking for you to consider donating to help keep them on the air often comes with the assurance that they're just going to have to curtail the broadcast in your area if you don't help. Several of these folks support overseas works, which they show pictures and videos of while telling how listeners just can't call themselves Christians if they go to bed without sending some money to support the project to buy beds for those who don't have any. The list is endless. Sadly, many shysters and profiteers get lumped in together with those truly trying to do a good godly work. We end up seeing the resulting confusion. People don't understand why, if God supplies all the need, that they should be responsible for supporting a ministry or broadcast. Why should the local pastor have to stand in a pulpit saying that they can't pay the electric bill? The Bible does spell out how Christians are to give. Ministers do need to teach and preach proper doctrine, including giving of tithes and offerings. People need to know how and what God expects of them in respect to giving. God may give directions for a specific situation for his people to contribute in some particular manner. The problem comes when we get in the habit of making merchandise of the Word of God. I can call it an offering or I can call it a gift. But if I require a specific amount from you in order for me to let you have something from me, we've agreed on a transaction. And basically, I've sold you something. If I promise to place your name on a a brick or a pew or a wall plaque or some other display of generous supporters, I've appealed to your vanity and pride rather than encouraging you to give quietly. I'm not saying preachers should never teach about giving. I'm not saying they should never ask for donations. But we need to give proper instruction about what the Bible says about finances. And we also need to practice what we preach. We never see anywhere in Scripture that Jesus sold anything. Undoubtedly, people gave to his work. I mean, why else would he have to have a treasurer? You know, that fellow Judas? Well, I don't want to get on to anybody about giving. The point I'm trying to make is that people who look at the church as trying to get their money have experienced some hurt and no doubt have seen some charlatans parading around as righteous, upstanding Christians. It's hard for them to separate the pastor teaching his congregation the right ways and attitudes about giving from the guy on TV, radio, or the Internet promising you'll see a miracle in the morning if you just send him $50 tonight. It's even more difficult for many to understand when the person asking for their money owns multiple mansions, airplanes, expensive cars, and appears to live far beyond the means of most of their audience. Should they live in poverty? No, 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 not at all. It's fine for God's people to to prosper, and it's fine for people to see that God blesses those who do his work. It's also fine for those truly doing his work to live like normal, everyday people. Many of these preachers do, in fact, give large amounts back into the work and to other works. Many live quite comfortably without being excessive. Many quietly assist others in the background in ways that we never hear anything about. Perhaps some of you who are listening right now have been hurt in a church-type situation. Maybe you've seen TV preachers that, well, they seem to be more like carnival barkers than ministers of the gospel or salesmen. My goal is not to try to convince you that they're doing right or wrong. God knows their heart and intent. Their works and actions either align with Scripture or they don't. What I'm hoping is that you'll simply entertain the thought that possibly much of what they preach could be true and correct, even though it's mixed with some pretty questionable tactics. Standing up for certain principles in the Bible doesn't make it right to ignore others. It's also true that violating some teachings doesn't make all the teachings wrong. 
one person may possess a great understanding of prophecy, but at the same time not grasp the idea that God still heals the sick. Another might be able to explain how to overcome depression and, and live in joy while lacking the most basic understanding of how to treat his or her spouse properly. Not everyone learns the same lessons at the same point in their life as other people. One well-known Bible verse states that the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money's evil. Nothing's evil about money. What we do to get it, keep it, and how we use it is where evil enters. The same verse that talks about the love of money being the root of all evil goes on to say that some have longed for it so much that they have turned from the faith or the truth of God and brought many sorrows upon themselves. If you want to read about it, look in the sixth chapter of the book of First Timothy. As a matter of fact, that warning was given to a young pastor. It went on to advise him to flee that kind of life and way of thinking and seek after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. He was instructed to put a greater emphasis on faith. Some have started out preaching the word and gotten sidetracked by money and fame and other types of riches. The truth contained in the Bible remains true, even if spoken by the devil himself. Daily, people reject the invitation to turn their lives over to God because of something that they've seen done wrong in a church or by a minister. Throngs of people refuse to visit a church for the same reason. You know, often they won't visit Church A because 30 years ago, Church B, which, by the way, is in a different denomination located in a different state, did, well, whatever to them. No matter how wrong the circumstances were, and how often they, they seem to be repeated elsewhere, it just really seems unfair for a person to keep themselves from receiving the most that they could have because of someone else's poor example. One of the common responses states that, well, they read the Bible, or I, I have my own time with God, I have my own relationship with Him, uh, you know, we understand each other. Well, that may be true, may sound excellent, but neither fulfills the Bible directive to assemble together with other believers. You can find reference to that if you want to look it up in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 25th verse. We can't be under the guidance of a shepherd without being part of the flock. Neither can we participate in the activities as members of the flock without being a part of it. One short, rather profound statement I've heard says, You don't give up eating because mom once burned biscuits. How sad it would be to stop eating just because mom burned a batch of biscuits. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Who in the right mind would starve themselves to death based on one or even several bad experiences with poor chefs? But spiritually speaking, it happens daily. People snack on television tidbits that appeal to them, much like folks who only eat snack food. They may grow, but it's not a healthy growth. It might even lead to an early death. Going to church won't make you a Christian, but neither will faithfully watching or listening to a broadcast ministry. Buying a special book or sending an offering to support a work won't do it either. Biblical evidence exists supporting that assembling together with fellow Christians, as well as reading the Bible, are good things, but none of these things alone make a person a Christian. A quick way to determine if you're really a Christian is to ask yourself if you are absolutely certain if you'd go to heaven if you died this instant, right now. now. I know that sounds like a simple question to some of you, but the answer really is quite revealing. You know, if you said you're pretty sure, or you think you probably would go, well, the answer actually then is no. You're not absolutely certain. Well, some might say, well, no one can really know for certain. And that's simply a cop-out to try to feel better about not being able to say, yes, I do know for certain. Some may think it's an overly simple and judgmental uh, statement to make that I could say, well, you're not going if you can't say yes. Well, it is overly simple. Man makes it complicated. God made it simple. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter and the 9th verse, 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't get much simpler than that. You don't have to send an offering, special gift, or buy anything. If you have any doubt, you can pray with me out loud right now and settle the issue forever. It's okay to repeat these words after me as long as you mean them from your heart. If you want to become a Christian, then pray with me. Dear God, I admit I have sinned. I am a sinner. I am confessing Jesus right now with my mouth. I choose to believe Jesus died for my sins, and you raised him from the dead. I want Jesus to be my boss or Lord from now on. I'm asking you to forgive all my sins. I choose to turn away from sin, and with your help, I will not sin anymore. I will do my best to live according to your word, the Bible. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, then tell God thank you for making you a Christian. It's important to pray daily. It's not hard. Just talk to God and take time to listen for His reply. One great way to hear from Him is through the Bible. Before you read, take a few minutes to thank Him in advance for talking to you. Ask Him to help you understand what you read and to speak to you through it. It's also extremely important to tell others that you are now a Christian. That's part of what faith is about. Regardless of how you do or don't feel, you choose to put your faith in God's Word and believe it. The proof will come in time. I encourage you find a church, a real brick and mortar place to go and get together with others and learn about God and His Word. Sunday school will help you learn a great deal as well as other opportunities like Bible studies and the like. Lastly comes one of the most important parts. Tell others what just happened to you. Tell everyone you can that you just became a Christian and invite them to do the same. You can lead them in a prayer similar to the one you just prayed. You have the authority to go forth and spread the gospel. Jesus said in the book of Mark, the 16th chapter and verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You have his authority to do so. Freely sharing how you became a Christian is the ultimate product. It's the true Christian sale. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Please join me again next time for more Redneck Theology.